Hi, good afternoon everyone. Welcome to another interactive webinar brought to you by Fly Free for Health. My name is Kylie and I'm your medical butler and moderator for today. Infertility is defined as the inability to conceive after a year of regular sexual intercourse without using any contraception. Infertility represents a major life crisis for couples of childbearing age, and it affects both men and women. To explain to us further, we have invited a practicing obstetrician and gynecologist and an IVF and fertility specialist with Monash IVF. He is also a visiting medical officer for Mercy Hospital for Women in Heidelberg and Box Hill Hospital. He has private admitting rights to Epworth Hospital Group and Mitcham Private Hospital. He commenced his master's program in reproductive medicine with a new University of New South Wales in 2009. He is currently a consultant gynecologist in a reproductive medicine unit at Mercy Hospital Unit in Australia. I am proud to present to you Dr. Kenneth Leong. Good afternoon, Dr. Kenneth Leong. We are very honored to have you here. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for attending my webinar. Uh, my talk today is on infertility uh, with the uh, provocative title of The Stalk Failing to Deliver the Baby. Um, unfortunately, this is uh, it's far too common and, uh, and it's an interesting topic. Um, let's just start here. Firstly, uh, I just want to talk about why this is such an important topic. Now, um, you know, I hear the young uh, couples saying, but I'm young doctor, I have plenty of time, don't I? That may or may not be so. And in this talk, I will cover a few areas, uh, starting with just a general overview about uh, what infertility is, and a little bit about uh, talking a little bit about the basic anatomy and physiology um, of uh, muted. Uh, we'll talk about the causes, uh, and then we'll uh, cover some areas of uh, investigations and and look at some of the treatment options available today. As Kylie has uh, uh, defined uh, at the start, uh, infertility is generally regarded as uh, an absence of deliberate conception uh, after 12 months of uh, regular unprotected intercourse, and that's sort of defined as you know approximately two to three times a week uh, with the frequency of intercourse. This definition is not. Uh, definitely not hard and fast. Uh, I, I would uh, act as a guide and I certainly would refine uh, this uh, definition depending on the age group. A little more on that later. So exactly how common is uh, infertility? Um, it affects about one in seven couples. Somewhere in the range of about 15% of all couples are affected. So if you look at the proportion of uh, the, uh, based on gender, uh, you would find that male and female are equally, uh, if you like, to be blamed uh, for the cause of infertility. And then in about another 30%, you'd find that both male and female uh, are actually both, uh, both have problems. And then in about 10%, uh, we don't quite know what the underlying cause is and what we call the unexplained, unexplained uh, group. So let's just cover on some basic anatomy and physiology. Um, the next slide uh, is a picture of uh, a stylized diagram uh, of the human, of the female uh, anatomy. Um, I think we need to just go back one slide, Kylie. Um, so in, in this picture, you can see the uh, picture of the vagina and the cervix, which forms the neck of the womb and leading up to this uh, uh, pear-shaped structure, which is known as the uterus. And the uterus uh, is generally a fairly, it's sort of like a heart-shaped cavity and leading off to the sides, uh, going into the tubes. 
and the end of the tube opens up like a flower, uh, which is an important anatomical structure. Uh, the end of the tube uh, and the uh, note that the ovaries are in close proximity to the end of the tube. Uh, so during ovulation, the egg is swept up in this flower-like structure, which then uh, propagates the uh, egg into the narrow part of the tube where fertilization tends to happen, or this area here. And then once fertilized, the egg then uh, is pushed into the, uh, the embryo is pushed into the cavity to implant. This is a uh, diagram of the female menstrual cycle depicted in, uh, uh, based on hormone levels of the very different hormones in the body and also the lining. Uh, the two most important hormones here uh, that stimulate follicles to grow are what we call the gonadotrophins or the LH and FSH, which uh, influences on these follicles here to grow. Uh, in a typical female menstrual a woman a female menstrual cycle in the human, uh, one uh, follicle tends to be recruited, and during the mid cycle, ovulation takes place. And after that, if uh, there is no fertilization in implantation, the hormone levels fall off, and you get this corresponding breakdown in the lining called the endometrium, that then sheds away, and resulting in bleeding, and hence the menstrual cycle uh, or the menstrual period. Okay, the next slide here is the anatomy of the, uh, the male reproductive organ. The most important um, part is the testis, which is the uh, area of sperm production. Um, in, in the testis, sperm is produced and uh, the production of sperm takes about just under, well, just slightly over two months, and once the sperm is produced, it is then stored in this area here called the epididymis. Uh, in this area, the sperm attains maturity and motility, so the ability to swim, and then it is stored here until ejaculation takes place, and during ejaculation, the sperm travels down this vas deferens which then joins in with the ejaculatory duct here with a duct from the seminal vesicle, which is an organ that produces uh, the semen or seminal fluid, which then forms most uh, uh, the, the predominant composition of the ejaculate, which is then ejaculated. So the causes of infertility, uh, one of the most common is problems with ovulation. Uh, in some cases, no ovulation at all or regular ovulation, and once the egg is ovulated, uh, transport could be an issue, as I have mentioned earlier, either due to disease of the end of the fallopian tube or blockages along the tube. Within the uterine cavity, uh, if you have abnormalities like polyps, fibroids, or septum, um, the embryo will have may have trouble implanting and resulting in implantation failure. Uh, sometimes implantation failure can be due to other issues uh, such as uh, hormone issues uh, or uh, you know rejection issue uh, and this other concern here which is fairly common uh, that I see in my practice called endometriosis. Male factor is important. Um, male factor uh, due, mostly due to uh, issues with production of sperm sometimes due to blockage uh, in, in the male reproductive tract. Uh, and you get a group of patients where we uh, unfortunately are not able to explain the particular course uh, after, after the standard investigations. More on that later. So this is a pie chart of the different causes of infertility based on uh, the different, well, based on the different causations. Uh, we have the male, which is quite a large part. Um, the tubal factor due to blockage or disease in the tube is another part of the relation problem. So these are the three main areas. Uh, if ovulation is an issue, um, the most common cause uh, of ovulatory disorder 
in um, is polycystic ovarian syndrome or polycystic ovaries. Um, you don't have to have the syndrome uh, to have problems with ovulation. Um, but the, the most common tests that one used to, to define this disorder are the common uh, hormone tests. Um, and the treatment here is with ovulation drug. Uh, the common one is the first line, in fact, is clomiphene citrate. And 80% of women will respond uh, to that treatment. Uh, for those who don't, uh, moving on to what we call recombinant FSH or injections with the stimulating hormone uh, often uh, would, uh, would help. Just want to uh, just, just briefly touch on the uh, hormone control of the uh, ovulation cycle. Um, we should just go back one slide, Kylie. Uh, you can see the four panels of picture. Uh, the it's called the hypothalamus pituitary ovarian axis, uh, which controls the ovulation cycle or the menstrual cycle. Um, the organ here called a hypothalamus, which sits um, close to the base of the brain, and there is a pine size uh, or peanut size uh, organ gland here called the pituitary gland, and these hormones are produced uh, in sequence and a cascade of reaction with the hypothalamus influencing the pituitary and the hormones produced by the pituitary influencing on the ovaries. Uh, so you've got this stepwise cascading type uh, control. Other hormones uh, that are very important in reproduction is the thyroid hormone, which is a gland that sits at the, uh, you know, uh, close to your um, throat or your windpipe, uh, which regulates many, many organ systems in your body. The uh, ovary here, I just wanted to show here the difference between a normal looking ovary, well, sorry, a polycystic ovary, which is uh, full of cysts. Uh, here is a picture of an atrophic or abnormal uh, shrunken ovary commonly seen in the menopause women. So polycystic ovarian syndrome is uh, one of the uh, most common endocrine diseases affecting women. Uh, in the child, in, during their childbearing age, it is also a leading cause of infertility. Uh, the symptoms, aside from having infrequent periods or sometimes no periods at all, uh, some patients have an excess in male pattern uh, body hair. Uh, they may have hair loss. Uh, they may have acne. Some of these women certainly may be large, uh, and these women, some of these women, are prone to depression. However, the point that I'd like to make here is that certainly not all women uh, uh, with polycystic ovarian syndrome have polycystic ovaries, and certainly not all women with polycystic ovaries have polycystic ovarian syndrome. It's a, it's a point uh, that the doctors uh, would uh, have to define uh, and, and work out from blood tests and ultrasound scan and also from the clinical picture. Okay. I've touched on this briefly before. Uh, the treatment would depend on uh, the symptoms and also uh, the most, the first and foremost, it would depend on whether the patient has had any treatment before, whether this is a first treatment, whether the partner has any issues with, uh, male, uh, with sperm problem. Um, if it's just an ovulation issue, then the first line of treatment often is to start the patient on clomiphene. Uh, sometimes metformin is another diabetic drug may be added um, to uh, control some of the um, uh, other issues with polycystic ovarian syndrome. Uh, a surgery to investigate uh, the fallopian tubes uh, sometimes is needed, and at the same time, ovarian drilling or diatherming of the ovaries is often done together, and this may help some women to ovulate spontaneously after the surgery. There are other disorders that may cause ovulation problem, and uh, hyperprolactinemia is one of them, which is a hormone uh, in the body uh, that's produced by the pituitary gland, uh, that peanut gland, uh, and bromocryptin is a drug that can be used to treat that. Uh, this disorder here, I, I, it's, it's very rare, suffice to say, and uh, 
it's probably not worth uh, talking too much about it. Okay. Um, blocked scar or damaged tubes, uh, fallopian tubes. That is uh, is the most common, uh, one of the most common causes of uh, infertility uh, in the female, uh, and it's often due to infections, uh, pelvic infection from uh, sexually transmitted infections, and also endometriosis can can cause the problem. Uh, the investigation often to diagnose this is either a special x-ray called hysteria cell pingogram or an ultrasound scan with a special dye called levovist that's called levovist sonohysterography and another test <coughs> that is often done uh, is a procedure called keyhole surgery or laparoscopy where the fallopian tubes are, are checked at the same time by dye injecting into the uterus and observing dye running out through the ends of the tubes uh, during surgery. So the treatment here would depend on the causes, uh, it will, would depend on the blockage and, and exactly where is uh, the blockage along the tube. If the blockage is at the start, sometimes that can be, can be treated with the passage of a fine catheter. Um, if uh, the blockage happens at the end of the tube, uh, that sometimes can be treated with surgery uh, to, to open up the end. And this day and age, most tubal, co uh, tubal infertility or fallopian tube problems, um, most, uh, most patients uh, would now be, um, recommend, uh, be recommended IVF. And if they've got fluid um, in, within the tube, it is recommended that these tubes be removed or clipped prior to starting uh, infertility treatment because the, uh, the fluid contained within the tube can leak back into the uterine cavity and can actually poison the implanting embryo. Endometriosis uh, is due to uh, tissue from the lining of the wound that's called endometrium. The glands within the endometrium are actually found outside the uterus. Uh, in many areas, commonly found uh, within the pelvis and sometimes in the lower abdomen and as far as the brain, the diaphragm and the lungs have been observed. But the most common areas that it affects, that they are found, the lesions are found are on the bladder, uh, on the tubes, end of the tubes, on the ovaries, uh, on the surface of the uterus, sometimes within the muscle wall of the uterus, behind the uterus, between the uterus and the bowel called the couch of Douglas on the pelvic side walls along the ligaments called the uterosacral ligaments. So these are the, the most common areas and they appear as thick patches, plaques or little nodules. When they are found on ovaries they can form into a little cyst called chocolate cyst. It is estimated that about 10 to 15 percent of women are, are affected by this problem and a lot of women don't actually have any symptoms, but the most common symptoms are severe uh, period pain, uh, period pain that doesn't, um, is not controlled by, you know, painkillers or the contraceptive pill, uh, pain during intercourse, uh, felt deep inside the, uh, the pelvis. Uh, sometimes if this is not controlled, a patient will develop what we call chronic pelvic pain syndrome, uh, which it, is, it, it becomes a difficult problem to manage. If the lesions are found in the bladder or sometimes in the rectum, you can have bleeding you know, or pain during bleeding, uh, during urination and death uh, when you open your bowels. And sometimes blood are also seen uh, uh, coming from the, the bladder and the rectum uh, during the menstrual cycle. In my practice, I would see 30 to 50 percent of my patients uh, uh, that come to see me with infertility would have endometriosis. I just want to show you that's what it looks like. This is the uterus, the rectum here, the vagina is there. These are the areas called the uterosacral ligaments. The common area that you find these lesions are just just between the uterus and the bladder, uh, sorry, and the rectum. Sometimes if they're found on the ovary, uh, they look like a chocolate cyst when you cut into this cyst here, dark, uh, altered, uh, liquid blood, thick blood runs out 
uh, basically due to altered blood that's been there for a while. So the treatment, uh, depending on the presentation and the problem the patient has, would involve either excision or removal of the endometriosis uh, to treat the pain, to remove the, the cyst on the ovary, and, uh, and uh, some of these patients may need to go on to have um, IVF. Just a quick run through of the different of the abnormal uh, shapes of uh, uteruses that you can find. Uh, septate uterus is probably the most common, where the little septum is found in the middle of the cavity, kind of partially div dividing it. Um, sometimes you can have uteruses that are malformed uh, with two separate horns, um, and then you can have uterus, um, you know, this particular one uh, where you have scarring within the lining of the womb, either due to pretty bad infections or lots of uh, multiple uh, curettes or uh, operations in the past, particularly for uh, miscarriages. I mean, one or two miscarriages don't usually, it's not usually a problem, but when you, when you have more than you know quite a few, it can become a problem. Okay, here we have the uh, picture of what I'm trying to demonstrate here. Fibroids. Uh, fibroids uh, can be uh, basically um, benign growth of um, tumor within the muscle wall, uh, which can grow inside the muscle wall and presenting as a little bump. Sometimes it grows very close to the lining of, of the cavity and pushes in a known as little fibroid uh, that indents the cavity. And fibroids can also push out like that, like a pedunculated tumor. Um, fibroids that pushes and distorts the cavity of the womb uh, it is known to affect uh, fertility. So when you have multiple fibroids like that that occupies the cavity, um, one of the problems that uh, that can cause is the embryo have problems implanting. Um, it's, it's got nowhere to go. Uh, treatment of fibroids within the uterine cavity involves res resection of the fibroids via a procedure called hysteroscopic resection, where an instrument is passed through the, through the vagina in, uh, and through the cervix into the uterine cavity, and a resectoscope is used to cut out these fibroids. Uh, this is done under direct vision with the light source and the camera. Okay, let's touch on male infertility. Uh, in a semen sample, we look at a few parameters. The most important ones are the, the count, the sperm, uh, we like uh, more than 20 million per mil uh, to be normal. Uh, or not only that, we look at the way that the, the shape of the sperm um, is important. Um, sometimes they, they have two tails or a very short neck or mid piece. Sometimes their head is globular or round in structure rather than you know, a little bit oblong. Um, and we, the other criteria that we look at is the ability to swim, which is very important for the comotility. Uh, issues with sperm uh, can be due to either an obstruction in along the male reproductive tract, causing uh, you know the sperm to be held up and, and basically cannot be passed out. Uh, uh, the, the other issue is, uh, which is probably quite common, is the um, failure in production of sperm. Ejaculatory uh, problems is also, it's not that uncommon. Uh, issues with um, impotence uh, or ejaculatory uh, or erection type problems um, you often see. There is a condition called retrograde ejaculation where sperm, instead of coming out through the normal channel, is um, ejaculated into the bladder. Um, causing low volume uh, or close to no ejaculation, uh, no ejaculate seam, and and uh, in some of these patients, you would have to either um, you know collect the sperm from the urine um, after ejaculation um, once the urine is prepared, um, or sometimes you may have to go straight to the testes to get the sperm from. So the potential treatment. Uh, the most common one I have to say this day and age is IVF, and depending on the severity of the uh, sperm uh, quality, 
a patient may or may not need a procedure called ICSI or intracytoplasmic sperm injection. Uh, intrauterine insemination, meaning uh, processing the sperm, concentrating it, and then putting the aliquot of sperm uh, into the uh, uterine cavity at the time of ovulation. That's also done, but you need to have at least 10 million motile sperm uh, for it to, to work. Um, if the male partners had a vasectomy before, they can consider reversing that blockage, uh, that surgical blockage. Uh, this, operation, this operation is often, uh, you know, can take a few hours, uh, can be quite painful, and uh, the patient can be sore for, you know, for up to a few weeks. Uh, and success rate is certainly not guaranteed. Um, if the vasectomy has been performed greater than 10 years, if not five years, um, the, um, often the patient, the male patient, produce antibodies against the sperm. And even if you successfully reverse the blockage, uh, the sperm may be of such a quality that um, you know natural fertilization may be may be difficult. Uh, this, there is a group of patients that has this condition for unexplained infertility that makes up about 10% of the, uh, the causes. And, um, well, the treatment of unexplained infertility, sometimes the best thing to do is keep, just wait, you know, and give it enough time. Um, a lot of, uh, most couples will conceive. But I think it's important to bear in mind the age uh, of the woman. I mean, if the woman is already you know, 36, 37, and they've been trying for more than three years. Uh, in fact, more than two years, it's probably ill advised to wait. They probably should move on. And as to what they do, it would depend on the sperm quality and, you know, the couple's desire to conceive and how quickly. Often IVF offers the best solution. This is a graph to demonstrate uh, the importance of the ideal body weight and how that affects your fertility potential. As you can see, you're within 90% to 120% of your body weight, you're close to 90 to 100% uh, of your fertility potential. Anything less or more, you can see a drop off in your fertility potential. The next uh, slide demonstrates the maternal age or the age of the woman and how that affects her fertility uh, chances. Uh, if you, one is greater than 35, the there's a larger number of women in that group that will need more and more cycle numbers to conceive uh, compared to if you, know, you were less than 25. Um, the cumulative pregnancy rate is not only higher for this group and the number of women that is required to conceive, the number of cycles that are required to conceive in a younger age group are, are less. So what are the reasons to see a doctor early? I think if you've been trying to conceive for, certainly if you're less than 35 and you've been trying for 12 months, uh, I think you ought to go and see a doctor early. If you're more than 35, you know, sometimes we would say even trying to conceive with regular time intercourse. Um, if you don't have periods uh, or have infrequent periods, uh, well obviously if you've had your sterilization before and you're thinking about having that reversed, if you've had previous pelvic infections or any kind of abdominal surgery, and the most common one is appendix surgery, uh, if the doctor, your GP, finds that you, your pelvic examination is a bit, it's a bit abnormal, uh, you should really be referred uh, on to a specialist or uh, if you've had two miscarriages. For the male patient, if they've had any previous uh, reproductive organ problems um, or even surgery, We've had previous infections before. Um, obviously, if there is any abnormal examinations found uh, by your GP, trying to get them. Yep, that's the next slide here. When you see your fertility specialist, uh, often uh, blood tests are ordered in both male and female. In the male, you often be screened for infections and immunity against previous uh, against other nasty infections like rubella. Hormone levels are often checked, and ultrasound scan is often ordered. Laparoscopy, which is keyhole surgery, may be required uh, depending on the situation. In the male, a semen analysis is important. 
as I mentioned, your blood test looking for effective screen is important, and sometimes an ultrasound of the testes may be required if the male has quite severe sperm uh, issue. During the consultation, a history is taken. Uh, in, in the woman, it's important to pay attention to her menstrual history, how frequent uh, intercourse takes place, whether they've had previous uh, uh, pregnancies before, <clears throat> any previous gynecological, surgical, medical history, or any relevant family history of infertility, endometriosis, polycystic ovaries, cystic fibrosis, any kind of congenital abnormalities, alcohol, uh, drugs uh, that are important, medication history is important, whether you're a smoker, and in, again in the male, um, frequency of intercourse is important, whether there's any previous paternity, uh, previous uh, surgery to a testis, some baby, male babies are born with the testis uh, not uh, descended into the scrotum, and if that persists, then sperm production uh, will be an issue as an adult. So if there's any history of that um, or, or surgery to bring it down, that's highly relevant. If, uh, if the male has had infections before, um, previous um, uh, family history is also very important, like cystic fibrosis. Uh, there is a, a mutation in the gene uh, that causes cystic fibrosis, um, and often in, this, uh, in the males, uh, if you're a carrier of that gene, um, you may have issue with uh, congenital absence or blockage of that vas deferens, resulting in uh, no sperm, uh, or what we call azospermia in the ejaculate. Alcohol, drugs, medication, history are obviously important, like in the female. Okay, in the examination, the doctor will check your height, your weight, uh, and look at various things like, you know, whether you've got any abnormal hair, or facial hair. Um, pelvic examination is very important. Examination of the abdomen is also very important. In the male, uh, again, you know, the male is checked for uh, masculinity features, whether, you know, he's got a beard, uh, whether he's well muscled, uh, you know, testicular size is uh, important, uh, checking for best deference and the active rhythm is, uh, is also important, um, and checking for prostate disease, usually with the rectal examination a digital rectal examination. Laparoscopy, as mentioned, keyhole surgery, um, is often required for patients um, with unexplained infertility. If they've got a lot of period pain, uh, the little small cuts are made on the abdomen, and ports are inserted with instruments passed into the cavity. Uh, often, well, the carbon dioxide gas is run into the, uh, the abdominal cavity to increase the space for which the surgeon can, you know, maneuver around. Um, and you can see here um, the, the uterus, the tubes here, uh, there, and this is called a round ligament, the cecum, uh, sorry, the rectum and sigmoid here, and the uterus sacral ligament. And this is demonstration of a nice healthy tube and ovary on the left. Ultrasound scan is, uh, is the basic, um, usually first line imaging uh, of the female pelvis. Uh, important information that we, we can gain from that is to look at the size of the uterus, looking for fibroids, polyps, looking at the shape. Sometimes we'll be able to see endometriosis, particularly if they've got chocolate cysts on ovaries. We can look at follicular activity, how many follicles they have on the ovaries to give us an assessment of ovarian reserve. Here you can see the ovary with several follicles. So in a sperm count, as mentioned before, we pay attention to what we call sperm density, how many sperm per mil, um, motility, how many of them are swimming or, or motile, and how many of this motile sperm actually swims forward, what we call progressive motility and we look at this, the shape. It is interesting that the human uh, sperm population has more abnormal sperm than normal, but we like to have uh, less than 15% uh, of, um, of uh, well, 
less than 85% of abnormal sperm in any given ejaculate, but uh, at least 15% or more of uh, the ejaculate sperm uh, are normal. So you can see here, this is actually the normal sperm dimension uh, and proportion and shape. You can get a long head, you can get small head, you can have two tails, you can have a lobulated head, you can have curly tails, you can have all sorts of uh, different shape um, sperm. So I just want to touch a little bit about IVF treatment and IVF treatment uh, involves um, the woman taking a cocktail of uh, drugs, uh, usually by injections, to stimulate a crop of eggs produced from the ovaries. And during the stimulation phase, uh, the, uh, the progress is monitored by blood tests and ultrasound scans. Uh, and once the follicles containing the eggs have reached a mature size, a trigger or, or maturing injection uh, is given, which is a once-off injection to mature this, uh, the eggs. Uh, the follicles within the eggs, um, the eggs within the follicle, I'm just beg your pardon, and once the eggs are mature, the, the patient comes in and usually under a light anesthetic, uh, the, these eggs are retrieved, uh, usually done vaginally under an ultrasound probe, and um, once the eggs are obtained, um, the, the eggs are then processed uh, and in, uh, fertilization is then required, which can either be done by a standard method uh, where the sperm and the eggs are mixed in, in a dish or by ICSI where a sperm is, one sperm is used to, to push off or uh, in, micro-inject into an egg uh, for fertilization. Uh, once the, the the uh, eggs are fertilized, they become uh, initially called zygotes, and then progressively as they develop, they become embryos. And once the embryos have reached at least three to five days, uh, the embryo or embryos are put back into the uh, uh, receptive womb. So IVF treatment should be tailored to the patient's individual needs and requirements. And there are different methods of stimulation. Um, you need to talk to your fertility specialist about this um, if you require IVF treatment. This is just a, this is a very busy slide. I don't really want to labor on it except to say that uh, there are different drugs that we now use to manipulate the hypothalamus, pituitary, ovarian axis, um, and to stimulate the ovaries here to produce the eggs, which, is, uh, which are then harvested and fertilized and embryo uh, singular mostly now or plural sometimes are put back into the womb. Um, hopefully the woman will be pregnant. This is a picture of what the ovary looks like uh, when it's full of follicles. This is called a stimulated ovary containing quite, quite a lot of follicles. Um, this often can be quite uncomfortable for the patient. They often feel bloated. They may even have pain. Um, so during the procedure, a needle is passed through into each follicle to retrieve um, the cystic fluid within the follicle, which often contains the egg. Once the egg is matured, it is released from the lining of the, of the follicle. This is just another demonstration, a collection into a tube, then it gets looked at. And then this is a method of standard fertilization where you can see all the sperm surrounding an egg. This is the other method called sperm microinjection or ICSI. Uh, where um, the egg, the sperm here is injected, Kylie, that's fine, uh, the sperm is injected into the egg, uh, and this sperm you can see here is such a tiny little thing in comparison to the egg. This is what a day five embryo looks like. It's, uh, it's a nice demonstration here of what we call a blastocyst, which is a day five embryo. Uh, containing this bit here called the inner cell mass, which eventually becomes the, the fetus and then the baby. And these are areas are called the trophectodon cells, which then develops and become the placenta. Um, when, uh, when the embryo is uh, mature uh, and of good quality, it is then inserted 
uh, back into the uterus with the fine catheter, and the placement generally is around the midpoint of the um, of the uterine cavity. In this picture here, uh, in this next slide on freezing and vitrification and the surplus embryos uh, at Monash IVF now, they're usually day five, are then frozen by this particular method called vitrification, which is an ultra rapid freezing method um, where the embryos are frozen down to minus 196 degrees Celsius, um, called snap freezing. Uh, this is actually found to be a very good method to freeze and spoil embryos and a high number of them generally thaw successfully and implant and pregnancy rates are, are very good um, with this method. So problems conceiving can affect young or older women alike. Uh, watch out for other signs and symptoms alerting to medical problems. Um, probably it's a good idea to see a doctor before you plan to start a family. Uh, unfortunately. In Australia, uh, and I suspect in many parts of the world, uh, women just fall pregnant, uh, usually accidentally or unplanned, uh, and uh, often uh, they should, uh, you know, they discover that they have other issues that should have been dealt with before uh, falling pregnant. So that's a good idea to see a doctor before you consider conceiving. Uh, infertility treatment is available to overcome many infertility problems now. Uh, giving a chance at pregnancy, and pregnancy uh, via IVF uh, is now uh, much higher than pregnancy, uh, natural pregnancy, uh, for for women under the age of 35. Pregnancy rates are still fairly good for women over over the age of 35 uh, compared to their natural pregnancy rates. So. We've got some time here for some questions, uh, so I'll open it to the floor. Uh, if you've got any questions, please, uh, please ask. Thank you so much, Dr. Kent Neal, for giving us a clear insight about infertility. Uh, this is very timely, especially nowadays, when there is an increasing number of couples who cannot conceive and who are actively looking for answers. Let us move on to the interactive part of the webinar, where attendees are free to ask their questions to our speaker. You can type in your questions into the chat box below your console. While the others are still typing in, let me start with the first few questions that came in during the presentation. Dr. Ken here is a question for a 34-year-old woman. She said, I had operation two years ago due to myoma. The doctor said I can have a baby after two years, which is now. When she checked my ovaries, she saw a 4 by 4 centimeter cyst. Is it possible for me to have a baby, or do I have to undergo an operation again? Right. Um, firstly, uh, I think there are two answers to that question. Mm -hmm. um, uterine myoma, or commonly known as fibroid, uh, depending on the size, where they are, often they do need to be removed, especially if they are quite sizable and generally greater than 4 centimeters, or if they distort the cavity, because as we know, that can impact on fertility. Usually what I say to my patients, depending on, again, the size and where they are, uh, they should hold off on pregnancy for three months so that the uterine cavity has time to grow, uh, to heal back. Uh, and, and again, depending on the size of the fibroid, if it's a sizable cavity that's, uh, that needs to be repaired after the fibroid is removed, I would often recommend a cesarean section of the mode of delivery. Uh, I think two years, uh, if there are any, uh, perhaps if there are any other issues involved that I don't know about, but two years might be quite long uh, to wait. A cyst of four centimeters would depend on the type of cyst um, and what they look like on ultrasound scan. It's very important that cyst gets uh, properly assessed, uh, and often you would have to go to a high quality ultrasound place. And depending on where you live, uh, that may or may not be that readily available. Um, here, uh, I mean, you know, even in Australia, high quality ultrasound scans, you really need to know who to go to to get those high quality scans. If it's just a simple cyst, um, then often you just wait and it goes away by itself, but four centimeters is quite sizable. If the cyst have other characteristics, um, maybe suggesting something like endometriosis or endometrioma, 
then I think that needs to be removed first. Okay, thank you very much, Doc, for that very enlightening answer. Uh, we have another question here. I know someone who was born with only one ovary. What are the chances of her having problems with infertility in the future? Um, that's a very good question. Uh, it, uh, if, if that woman has a normal working uh, ovary, then her chances of conceiving is, uh, is pretty good, provided that obviously there are no other abnormalities associated with that, you know, meaning the uterus are okay uh, and the fallopian tubes work and often this can be tested beforehand. Uh, if the, it's a normal functioning ovary, the patient has regular periods and the blood hormone tests are all fine and the follicle counts are looking good, then her chances are very good. However, needless to say, in this patient, um, you know, if you're born with one ovary, that your reserve is going to be obviously half that of an, another woman with two ovaries, so it is important not to delay childbearing uh, if possible. Okay. We have another question here. Is it true that when you start having sex at a later age, it would lead to an increased chance of infertility? Um, I think the answer to that question is uh, probably no. I would think in to the contrary. Um, I mean, depending on what you mean by a delay sexual intercourse, I mean, if you delay sexual intercourse until you're 40, then the answer would be yes. But if you're talking about, you know, skipping, you know, ha having your first uh, intercourse in your late teens or early uh, 20s, you know, uh, that's that's probably not a bad thing. Um, you know, a lot of young couple, uh, young women who start uh, having intercourse when they're quite young, uh, often uh, with unprotected intercourse. Uh, in this, you know, patients, uh, women, they may contract you know, diseases, infections, which in fact lead to infertility and damage of the Philippine tubes. So it, it, I would have to say to the contrary, it's probably a good thing, especially if you practice unprotected intercourse, uh, which should never be practiced uh, unless you're in a stable, uh, loving relationship. Otherwise, you should always use protection. Okay, right. So uh, another question here. In some communities, we are aware that infertility is blamed mostly on women, even when um, the problem also could be or could depend on the men. Uh, do you have any suggestions for women to do to encourage their partners to seek medical help regarding their fertility, especially if they're having problems um, in conceiving and the, the woman is already exhausted in taking tests, going to different doctors, and her husband that, or partner doesn't want to, to go to the doctor because he believes that it's the woman's problem. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, fortunately in Australia that's not a common problem, but it this problem does exist in some communities in Australia as well. Um, I think education is uh, it's important. It's going to be very difficult to force these, uh, the males to go and have tests, but you know, it, it often takes two to tango. I mean, it wasn't, wasn't that long ago that women are blamed for you know, bearing a female girl, uh, a, a female uh, a child um, in, in communities that value male a child or you know offspring so but it, we now know that it is the male sperm that determines gender uh, so the same right. here applies mm -hmm. you know men and women are equally to be blamed if you like um, so <laughs> it's a difficult problem I guess if the woman goes off and have all tests possible and basically come back clear then you really have to say to the men look you know as far as I can tell I'm okay and uh, you have to have a semen test because, you know, at least 30%, if not more, of infertility problems in a couple is due to men. And it's nothing to be ashamed about. It's something that is common. It could be genetic. It's important to know it beforehand, before you start a family, because it can be propagated to your next generation. So I think education, listening to seminars like this, going to see the doctor as a couple, um, I think it's important. Now, there's no doubt that certain cultures, uh, cultural groups, are going to perhaps find that more difficult to accept that uh, male infertility is a problem. But 
it's it's the reality, and I think open dialogue and getting the patient to actually see a fertility specialist to start with uh, it would often help. Right, right. So it is also very important for everyone, men and women alike, to to understand this, to be educated. Okay. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, okay. men and women mm -hmm. are when men are just as important as women to procreation. Okay. Um, as we are running out of time, we have our last two questions here. Okay. Uh, I have been taking the pill for 10 years. Will that affect my ability to become pregnant when I'm ready? Uh, the answer to that question is no. Mm -hmm. um, pill, pill is often blamed as a cause of infertility, but uh, you know it depends on the reason why you were put on the pill to start with. Uh, some women are put on the pill because they have troublesome periods uh, or if they have you know, painful periods, irregular periods. So that may be the underlying cause uh, for example, if you've got irregular periods and you go to see a doctor, your doctor say, well, go on the pill and you take that for 10 years. When you come off the pill, the underlying cause, which is irregular periods to start with, is still there. So polycystic ovaries, for example, and obviously going on the pill in most cases won't change that uh, or endometriosis is, is, is another uh, reason. So it is not the, uh, the cause of your infertility. Um, Quite often, when you stop the pill, even after prolonged periods, uh, your cycles, I would often see, you know, coming back. There are certain type of hormone contraceptions that you could see a delay in return of fertility, but the the pill these days in in the fairly lo in a low dose that we now are used to, are often often are quite safe. Uh, uh, and you know, previously injections like Depo-Provera, uh, mm -hmm. that's given, you know once a month, for, you know, that lasts for three months, uh, an injection that lasts for three months called depo Pereira, we often see, you know, women uh, have a delay in returning, uh, in the return of their fertility. But I feel it's generally not the cause of uh, infertility per se. Okay, thank you. And our last question here is about male uh, fertility. And the question is, are hot tubs really bad for men? Uh, I think the answer is uh, no. I mean, unless you soak in hot tubs a couple of hours a day, seven days a week, um, you know, which is probably you find no time to do anything else if you were to do that. But I think you, you know, enjoy the occasional soaking in hot tubs. I can't see why that is the, the I mean, it is written, you know, in, in uh, the lay media uh, uh, that, you know, that's the, is the possible cause. I doubt very yeah. much that that is the problem. Mm -hmm. Okay. So th thank you very much again, Dr. Ken, for answering those questions. Uh, other, questions can be, other questions can be answered via email after this session. And you may also chat with our medical butlers anytime at flyfeeforhealth.com. So we'd like to thank everyone for actively participating. This has been a very meaningful webinar. I would also like to extend our sincerest gratitude to our invited speaker. Thank you, Dr. Kenneth Young, for taking the time out of your busy schedule to uh, educate and promote health awareness for people from all over the world. Of course, we'd also like to thank Fly Fee for Health for making this possible. To our attendees, let us know what you think about this webinar by filling out our survey form after this session. 